Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session on CyberSight. Uh, it's been a wonderful four days that we've had stalwart speaking on various topics related to this crisis today. And I would try to do justice to the systems management post-COVID lockdown. And a very topical subject, uh, all of us are battling with it. Uh, unfortunately, there are no good answers. There are no right answers. Uh, it's very dynamic. The situation keeps changing. The information keeps changing. And uh, I'll just run you through some of the things that are affecting us and how we could manage that. So we all know that this uh, lockdown has created quite a lot of uh, havoc, not only in our professional life, but I think in our day-to-day -day existence. And from the first lockdown, now we are approaching the fourth lockdown very soon. And a recent survey in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology has shown that uh, the lockdown and the coronavirus situation is causing a lot of stress to ophthalmologists. A significant number are feeling depressed. But I would only like to say that uh, there are difficult, these are difficult times, but uh, I think it's the attitude that we need to have to face it. And that is what determines whether we would be able to find success or failure in this situation. So it's very important to look at how we can deal with it and move on. So we need to be informed, we need to be prepared, be smart and be safe, and should be ready to fight this COVID-19. I would at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the role of Orbis in not only having this platform CyberSight, which at one point appeared to be a little ahead of its time, but today, as we can see in this, the role of digital information and how CyberSight uh, is a platform that not only helps in connecting each other and having these webinars, but also in management and training uh, of uh, apology of uh, doctors. Uh, a lot of this work has been done, which I'm going to be presenting with the help of Orbis, which set up the Quality Resource Center at the Shroff Hospital. And uh, we have been working through our quality uh, uh, department, quality assurance department, uh, in developing systems to combat uh, COVID uh, and how these systems are going to guide us uh, in dealing with the situation. At this point, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Sunita Dubey and Mr. A.K. Singh, who are leading the quality initiative at the hospital. So the, we need to start right at the beginning from screening of patients. And it is very important that we don't bring in pathology inside. So the idea is that we as clinicians first have to make sure that we remain safe and we don't uh, get the infection. At the same time, we need to ensure that we don't spread infection. So we have to put systems to take care of both. So it's important that we have hand sanitizing stations available uh, patients should uh, wash their hands. Face masks should be compulsory, not only for the patient, but also for the attendant. Fortunately, most states today have made it mandatory. So you can actually refuse a patient to uh, be seen if the patient is not wearing a mask. Uh, we also like to insist that the uh, patient or the attendant has the Arigya Setu app uh, which gives you an alert and our security guards also have the app on their phone and in case there is a positive patient or somebody who's at high risk, uh, there's a possibility that you may get an alert. Before we 
ask, allow the patient to go in, we make the patient sign a declaration, which basically has questions on fever, on cough, on any of the symptoms that could be associated with COVID. Of course, now a little irrelevant, but travel abroad uh, or any history of contact with somebody who did. Uh, and this is a declaration that they sign. Along with that, we make them, uh, we get the phone number and the name of even the attendant so that if we have to do contact tracing, we can. Of course, thermal scanning is done. And uh, this is also the personnel has to be protected. Uh, so the shield and uh, gloves and a gown is a must. Uh, for this, they, the thermal scanners, we keep a cutoff of 100 degree Fahrenheit. So anybody who gets a little above that, uh, we should actually not go by just one reading if it is high because these scanners are not that accurate. Sometimes the patient may be standing in the sun, so we ask them to sit in the shade for some time and then recheck after 10 minutes. In case the patient turns out to have a temperature higher than 100, then the, there's a doctor who's called to that place. And if it is a red eye and a conjunctive eye, it is, we prefer that it is checked right there and not be taken inside. But if it's a condition that needs to be seen, then, then an isolation room is created where a slit lamp is present. Uh, this is away from the rest of the patients and uh, the patient is examined there. There is a roster for the doctor who's going to be taking care of the emergencies that come like this. Now, it's okay to put these systems, but it's very important to see what all can go wrong. And it's been quite a struggle because uh, the entire staff hasn't been coming. You explain the procedure to one person today and the next day there'll be somebody else and it may fall apart again. Uh, we had some funny stories where uh, I asked this person uh, what's normal temperature and uh, he gave a range of th from 35 to 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it's important that the training happens that they know what is normal. We also had a, a, a quite an emergency situation where early morning a patient for chemotherapy for retinoblastoma came and after two minutes of entering, the security guard got an alert on the phone. And since this was the only patient who had entered at seven in the morning, uh, the patient was quickly brought down. Uh, the person who handled the person was put in isolation. Uh, and there was a lot of confusion. This is the first time that it happened. After some time, we realized that they didn't even have a smartphone. Uh, and it was an alert probably from somebody across the road or somewhere. And, but for one hour, there was a lot of confusion. We were making the patient go to a COVID hospital. In the meantime, the patient got psyched and they left and it was quite a struggle to get the patient back in. So it's very important that the people who have been given the responsibility for the, doing these jobs are trained well. They should know what, what to do. And in case something comes out of the normal, then we need to ensure they are aware of what are the next steps and there shouldn't be too much panic uh, that happens because of lack of knowledge. So we've learned along the way and uh, I'll take you through uh, what all needs to be done to manage these situations. If there's a patient with conjunctivitis or a red eye, uh, it's best to be seen by a designated doctor Outside, you really don't need a slit lamp. If a torch light examination, it can be done because uh, conjunctivitis could be a sign of a COVID disease. Uh, we have ready-made prescriptions with an antibiotic drop. We also tell them in case you have fever, myalgia, cough, then you need to report and go to one of these COVID hospitals. So it's all written down in a pre-printed prescription, which the doctor can prescribe right there. So these are available uh, right outside so that there isn't too much of uh, writing and things that happens. It's all written on a pre-printed prescription. Social distancing, again, required a lot of modifications in the way we work. 
uh, we actually uh, made multiple waiting areas. So instead of confining patients to a few clinics because the volume is lower, we said, let's spread it. So we have multiple clinics and we actually opened up more spaces through which the patients could come. So a lot of segregation, we opened new gates in the hospital, made new patient flows so that uh, there's no crowding anywhere. Uh, some of these chairs which we had were fixed with three to four uh, seats together. And so to maintain social distancing, we put some strings so that people don't sit or we put some tape uh, so that there's enough space in between. Also, the floor is marked at the counters so that people stand uh, with a respectable distance. Fortunately, there's been a lot of awareness in the society, and so people seem to be uh, maintaining that. In the clinic, again, we don't want the patient to go through multiple uh, people. And so the earlier system where we had some triaging of somebody doing vision, then somebody doing autorefractometer, NCT, and then uh, somebody doing a refraction, then the doctor seeing. Uh, we re removed all that. The patient enters a room and between an optometrist and one doctor, we try to finish everything. Uh, we don't want the patient to be moving to, uh, to too many people because uh, then there'll be that many people who can get affected. Basically, you're trying to uh, see, you, you believe that every patient who comes may be positive. And so you have to take universal precautions. Uh, so, like I said, the patient should have a face mask. Mask. It's okay to do an applanation tonometry if needed, uh, but it needs to be cleaned after every use, uh, and the alcohol wipe is uh, enough. Auto refractometers, non-contact tonometers, and syringing should be avoided, as they could be aerosol that they that these uh, tests can generate, and it's best avoided. Well, we also created some infrastructure changes so that our staff gets protected. And this glass was fixed uh, on the registration counters everywhere. However, it comes with new problems because the patient has a mask. This increases the distance that our staff could hear what the phone number is or the address is to register the patient. And so we had to put a PA system to allow them to hear what the patient is saying. So, these are practical issues that sometimes come up. Uh, while doing the examination, we got these acrylic sheets put on our slit lamps so that there's a barrier between the patient and the uh, clinician. Of course, the patient should have the mask on and uh, the patients have sometimes a tendency, as soon as they come close to the slit lamp, they pull it down. So you have to ensure that they put the mask up. Uh, uh, you can guide the patient not to speak while the slit lamp examination is happening. And then you pull back and uh, whatever discussion needs to be done can be done. Uh, it's important that the doctor also wears a mask, a good quality mask. Doesn't necessarily in the OPD have to be N95, but if uh, at least a three-ply uh, surgical mask. Uh, we wear gloves when we examine. At our place, we are using water-resistant uh, gowns also, uh, and an eye protection. Uh, we tried using visors, uh, face shields, but it's difficult to do a slit lamp examination or indirect ophthalmoscopy with that on. So it's best to have uh, protective glasses when you're examining. The housekeeping is instructed that uh, the floor is mopped and the knobs and the railings are cleaned uh, with 1% sodium hypochlorite uh, every two hours. Uh, the other thing that we've done in our processes, and it's important to do that, is that we have divided our whole hospital into three teams. So the A team comes on Monday and Thursday, the B comes on Tuesday and Friday, and the C team comes on Wednesday and Saturday, and we encourage that they don't even meet each other socially in the evening. Uh, this is to ensure that in case one team gets compromised, 
then we know the other teams are clean and they can take over. So uh, across the system, we have these three, three teams. Uh, one could have two teams or three teams, depending on the load and the possibility of making teams. It does cause us stress in certain areas, but I think right now the workload allows us to have three teams. Uh, in our appointment systems also we've modified, we spaced out the appointments so that there's no crowding. We still get a significant number of patients as walk-ins. And so we, with, who come traditionally in the forenoon. So we've left the forenoon for walk-in patients and the patients who are seeking appointments are encouraged to come in the afternoon. And the slotting has also changed from two patients every 15 minutes to one patient every 15 minutes. Uh, this is to ensure that there is more spacing between the patients. We have extended the day so that uh, we, we are able to see patients if, uh, and, and on a longer day uh, so that there's assurance of, you know, that there's no crowding in between. The operation theater again needs a few changes and the SOPs have had to be modified for COVID uh, again. Uh, in the ward, we spaced out uh, the beds. We've removed beds in between uh, to ensure uh, social distancing. On the day of the admission, the patient undergoes another check where the temperature is checked Again, the history of cough or headache or myalgia is taken. Uh, so the system ensures that every patient gets this test and a new declaration is taken because it's possible between the time you scheduled it and now that the patient may have acquired some uh, symptoms. So this is done in a specific location. Uh, the patient enters the OR as well as throughout the surgery wears a mask. Surprisingly, the patients are doing quite well. There is no uh, problem of claustrophobia that we've seen uh, generally. Uh, we, again, in the operation theater, uh, don't call a lot of patients together. There's spacing between surgery. All instruments like BP apparatus, stethoscope are disinfected after every use. Uh, the peribulbar block is given inside the room with full uh, uh, protection. There's a designated doffing area for the PPEs. Uh, the scrub nurse uh, wears a visor for protection, while the surgeon wears a, a protective glass. Uh, now, the other difference is that in between cases, uh, we keep a, a time duration of between 20 to 25 minutes. This is to allow the air exchange. So if the previous patient had any infection, we don't want that to be passed on to the next patient. And we are keeping the HEPA filters on and the air conditioning on, but we wait for 20 to 25 minutes between cases. Uh, the surgeries that could generate aerosols are uh, done with full PPEs. I'll come to that very soon. Uh, so they have to wear the entire uh, full personal protective equipment, while if the non-aerosol uh, generating procedures, the, the main difference is that we are using double uh, gloves, uh, and that is so that when you're doffing your gown, uh, you first remove the first glove, and then you remove the gown. Uh, after that, the, you remove the inner glove. So, so that while you're removing the gown, you don't touch your, the gown with naked hands. And of course, you uh, should try to touch the gown only from the inside. Uh, the, of course, the OT table needs to be cleaned after every case, disinfected. Uh, and there is daily fumigation that we are doing uh, right now. Now, a lot of controversy on it, although COVID test is not mandatory. Uh, for surgery, but for the protection of our own personnel, we have created a list where uh, of 
surgeries that we insist that the patient should have a negative COVID test before we take them up. Uh, largely, all the cases that may require intubation, so GA cases over 30 minutes, uh, they undergo COVID testing. Uh, some of the oculoplasty cases that require drilling and things like DCR uh, would need COVID testing. Uh, there are, if you are using cautery, it could possibly generate aerosol, so they, that also comes on the list. Uh, for COVID testing, you have to ask the designated lab uh, personnel to come, and then they take the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, this is quite tedious because the patient may need to wait in the hospital. There could be a waiting of two to three hours before the lab people would come to take the swab, uh, and the report may take 24 to 48 hours to come. So if there's an eye-threatening case like a corneal laceration or endophthalmitis, uh, we take the swab in the perioperative uh, period. Uh, we may not hold the patient uh, if the surgery is required early, and, uh, but we would take the swab nevertheless before the patient leaves the hospital so that we are aware of what happens. And during surgery, of course, you have to take universal precautions that uh, everybody is protected. Now, if you see a lot of these procedures are, uh, if you reflect back in somewhere in the early 80s, uh, we modified the way we worked in the operation room because of HIV. And eventually we created universal precautions. Uh, I think something similar is happening with COVID that you have to take universal precautions uh, simple things like hand washing. Uh, well, uh, it's we've been talking about hand washing for a very, very long time. Uh, but it's only now that it, when it comes to saving our own lives, we have become serious about it. So things like that, I think this COVID situation should take us to a much better, safer hospital practices and also behavioral change is what we should expect. So eventually, uh, this whole crisis should leave us with better practices, which should become more uniform. And this is how we should otherwise also have been dealing uh, with our patients. So there's a small modification that we need to do, uh, but it's all for good. I think it all is, a lot of it is common sense. Now, like with HIV, once in a while, you'll have a positive patient. Once in a while, you'll have a needle stick injury, and you need to know your next steps. So it's very important that in case there is a positive patient, then what are we supposed to do? So it's important to have good systems of contact tracing. We, unfortunately, in the very first week, uh, we had one patient who was for a traumatic cataract under general anesthesia, asymptomatic, the report after 24 hours uh, tested positive. And so we, we had to get back to the entire group of people who that day had seen the patient. Uh, and because it was a surgical patient had undergone a B scan, an A scan, a pediatric ophthalmologist, uh, and anesthetists and various other people like counselors, uh, registration staff who had seen the patient in between. So it's very important that the whole thing is documented well, uh, that you are able to trace back who all saw the patient. Electronic medical records definitely help, but sometimes you have, like in this case, we found that although the physical examination was done by one doctor, the signature was actually of the fellow or somebody else. So it's important that we follow good practices, uh, which in, we had some flaws here and there. So we put a more robust system. We've retrained everyone to uh, use their own pin and ensure that we have all documented who all see any patient. We've also created a nodal team a group of people who are the experts to deal with a situation like this. 
it's taken as an incident and an incident management team has been created. Uh, all these people have been asked for a home quarantine and we have a document now which uh, basically decides what is the level of risk uh, that the person has. Uh, and mostly we will come in the mild risk since we uh, are wearing an, uh, PPEs in, even in the clinic. Uh, also, most of the patients are not uh, very high risk and we are not very close. Uh, before surgery, we are not very close to the patient. So depending on the risk, uh, there is different levels of quarantine uh, that we have to ensure. So uh, it's important to create guidelines and have knowledge about what has to be done. Uh, so we have uh, an incident management team, and then we have now one person who's the person who looks after the staff safety in case something like this happens. So it's important to create a COVID task force. Uh, people who have a little more knowledge, they should know what has to be done. Uh, there shouldn't be any panic. This should become like a very matter of fact thing that if it happens, uh, we should know what has to be done. Uh, so having this team really helps. Uh, we also have among this team members, we have every day that one person is in charge. Uh, so there is one person who's in charge of the ship since uh, everyone is not coming every day. Uh, so it's important that uh, the line of uh, hierarchy is there and decision making can take place. Some of the challenges that we faced is that during this lockdown period is to implement, uh, you can write a good SOP, you can have a lot of good quality assurance principles, but how do you communicate down to every person since everybody is not coming every day? Uh, and so there are a lot of things that get lost in between. Also, a lot of hospitals develop silos. These are different departments, so you may say that, okay, we will wear this PPE or we need, everybody should wear a visor or things, but you may not have communicated it to your uh, stores department or purchase department to ensure that there are enough uh, of these available. So it's challenging to get the whole thing across the entire system because people are not there every day. So you may talk to one team and the other team may not get that information. So creating this line of communication is very important. Fortunately, these digital platforms like Zoom uh, quite help, but then everybody may not uh, be there. Uh, the staff is limited. Sometimes uh, people have this problem of public transportation that they may not be able to come. Those who are not able to come uh, are okay, but th those who come may complain that why are we getting exposed? So you have to handle your human resource also because uh, there is this issue of uh, the people who are coming may complain that what about the no-shows who are not coming? So whatever you systems you create, it's very important that you measure and have a checklist uh, for monitoring. So uh, they should be a team that is constantly monitoring that all these things that we have created are being followed. Uh, we've had these issues, like I mentioned about the Arogya Setu app alert, uh, that opened up you know, a lot of confusion, so we were able to put systems back. Similarly, this patient who turned positive required to be managed and uh, because of these incidents, we've been able to put better systems in place. Now, going forward, uh, technology has also helped in reaching out to our patients and having electronic medical records has really helped. Uh, so when patients call, we can open up their records. We know what has happened. Like for me, uh, there was a corneal transplant patient who complained of a little pain. When I opened the records, I could see that he had stopped using a steroid drop. And uh, I was able to instruct the patient and uh, follow the patient up on telephone. Uh, having some video consults helped. 
these are just WhatsApp pictures on which we made a diagnosis of herpes zoster and the patient was managed and the patient's pain and uh, agony was taken care of so much so that the patient gave a pretty large donation to the hospital because he was so happy about the treatment that he received. So having a combination of uh, tele uh, of your electronic medical records and some pictures together you can manage patients quite well. Uh, of course, there's a need for developing much better systems for communication and video consults. I think somewhere we would start working on them, but even this informal system of WhatsApp and EMR has helped us a lot in our communication with the patient. And I see that as we move on, there'll be more contact lens interfaces in, uh, that we'll have. And telemedicine, we can now see the big role of it. Uh, through the vision centers, technicians can take pictures and we could do consults sitting over here. Uh, we can teach them how to take basic, these are pictures taken of cornea uh, by our vision technicians through their mobile phone. Good enough for us to make a diagnosis, good enough for us to tell what's a surgical procedure, what, which patient needs an urgent referral. Uh, we've even made diagnosis of dendritic keratitis based on these kind of pictures. Uh, so having good systems like that would help in managing patients remotely. And these, this is something that we need to uh, strengthen as the days come. I think CyberSight has a great platform where you could do a lot of close group consultations with your own teams. Uh, this is something to be explored further. Uh, and EMR and WhatsApp kind of systems also informally work, but as we move along, we need to have more formal systems for uh, doing this teleconsultation. Uh, from a secondary center, again, the comprehensive doctors could take images and a secondary center, a, a specialist from a, a tertiary care center could help in managing the patient. So I think the next step is how can we have our patients take much better picture? We, we've uh, recently made a video uh, for them as instructions to take pictures and then sending to us. Uh, but I think that's the future that every time a patient comes to a hospital, at the end of the consultation, there's also a tutorial on how to take a better picture. There's a magnifying glass with how to take, uh, have good lighting, use, using a mirror. All these kind of things would probably be things that we need to improvise on as we move along. Like this meeting, I think video conferencing through these uh, different digital platforms have been very useful. In fact, I was in one of the board meetings this week and when we were trying to schedule the next meeting, I said, hopefully the COVID uh, situation would be uh, out by then and we'll, have, we'll be able to meet each other. And everyone said, no, no, let's not do a physical meeting. Let's continue with this virtual meeting format because it saves a lot of time uh, and we, we are able to have enough communication this way. So these are new things that we have learned uh, with this crisis. Uh, we can have good webinars. We are having, in fact, much more attendance in our daily classes uh, that we have uh, during this period. So why not continue with the system uh, post lockdown? So these are new learnings, all for good, uh, that has come out of this crisis. So we need to strengthen the digital infrastructure uh, as we move along. One aspect that may, which currently has taken a hit is our community outreach programs. Uh, this recent notification that has come on 8th May very categorically says that no outreach camps must be undertaken and no mobile vans to be sent in the field. Of course, we don't want this kind of crowding in the camps and social distancing norms would not allow these camps to, to happen. So how do we handle uh, the community work that all of the community-based hospitals uh, are basically designed to do? We also know that the urban areas seem to be more affected with all these migrant problems that we are seeing. Uh, 
So vision centers in both urban areas as well as urban slums, as well as in the rural areas, uh, I think will take center stage. Uh, that's the way to go. Uh, we have been talking about it in the last decade. Uh, Dr. Rao started the vision center com uh, concept and I think they become even more relevant today. You have better access, so better uptake of services. We also feel that the rural areas are probably going to be less affected than the crowded urban areas like the Dharavi slums and the uh, places like the big metros have. Uh, if we create access, uh, envision centers become the answer for uh, taking care of blindness in the community. Uh, I think Mr. Tulsiraj also mentioned the other day that the tertiary care hospitals have shown only a 10% increase in footfalls uh, ever since some of the lockdown uh, was relaxed. Uh, but the vision centers have gone up to almost 60%. And that shows that access becomes a big thing. Uh, something that is close by, uh, you feel safe to go to. But when you have to travel long distances or distances within big cities, uh, it becomes a big problem. But when we are opening vision centers, we again need to have norms. We need to ensure staff safety. They need to be given protection. They need to be given training. The vision centers may need to be modified for social distancing. And including teleophthalmology in the vision centers would need a big push because if you can avoid patients coming to the big hospital, uh, I think it reduces the travel for the patient as well as the uh, crowd in the hospital. So having teleophthalmology associated with a vision center, I feel will be the next big step. Uh, we have been doing a little bit. There have been video consults, but I think that's something that needs to be strengthened as we go, for, go forward. So vision centers seem to be, uh, will play a big role as primary care centers for providing uh, community care. Now, they could be strengthened and the existing community teams that we have that were involved in camps could possibly go into villages with door-to-door -door screening. Of course, they would need their own norms and protection. Uh, this could be done around the vision centers. The teams could not only play a part in eye care awareness, they could also play a part in coronavirus uh, awareness and how about hand hygiene, about masks, about social distancing. And that way you'll win the hearts of the community and the administration. So including something like a door-to-door -door screening, uh, more intensive screening around vision centers might help. School screening, I think we still don't know what new norms will come. Uh, would photo screeners help? Are children relatively safe? And so will that work? This is something that we'll still have to see how uh, it pans out. Most of the institutes uh, that are into the community space also uh, have a lot of education happening in these institutions. And the lockdown has affected hands-on training. There's limited outreach activity, so the patient numbers have reduced. So there is a lot of cause for concern among the young ophthalmologists. How, how does this affect my training? So at one level, yes, the hands-on training temporarily has stopped. But on the other hand, these newer platforms of online classes, webinars, online courses have strengthened so much that it's difficult. Even right now, there are three or four uh, webinars happening and one is having to pick and choose. Uh, and these are a great medium for communication and you feel pretty close to the speaker as well with the video right on your face. Uh, one would need to strengthen wet labs and dry labs uh, so that you can reduce the need for that much of hands-on uh, surgery. Dr. Sangwan recently, just last week, uh, I think mentored a doctor in 
uh, South America sitting in uh, here in North India. Now, these are all possible today uh, with technology. So I think there'll be a change that we need to develop. We need to get more innovative uh, in the way we teach. Uh, and, and very soon, I think we'll adapt to newer methods of uh, courses for teaching. Uh, of course, the hands-on bit will still be required, and hopefully this is a temporary phase and we'll come out of it soon. We need to connect both emotionally and intellectually, and through these digital platforms, we need to be connected with our trainees. Uh, it's important that we give them support during this time. Lastly, the most important thing that's dealing, uh, that we are all battling with is hospitals are hit really bad uh, right now. And it's almost like a triple whammy uh, that we have because of coronavirus. Uh, we have one increased expenses that we are having to incur because of infrastructure change and PPEs and all these methods that we have to adopt to. They have decreased revenues because they shut down of regular operations, elective surgeries have stopped. Patients are right now scared to come for elective surgeries. Also the hospitals by themselves have become hotspots and so patients want to stay away. Their incomes have also come down. Some of our hospitals have also been turned into quarantine facilities, so we can't work in those places. So the government took over uh, because they needed beds for quarantine. So how do we deal with this crisis? I think we have to reduce our fixed costs temporarily. Uh, and of course, the major chunk of that would be salaries. And I think right now, most organizations, unfortunately, are having to uh, deduct salaries. Uh, now, when you're doing that, I think it's very important to have the right communication. Uh, get the employees involved. Get them involved in the situation. They will understand that better instead of just sending an email uh, about it. So we need to be very sensitive. We need to get them involved. We need to have good communication. Uh, and be sensitive to individual needs. There would be some people who may have a problem, so one would need to have channels open for communication. It's best to be done graded, where the ones who get the least salary are least affected. Uh, people with better salaries have a little cushion and hopefully they can handle a few months of lower salary. Of course, nobody has the right answer, but one has to do some kind of mathematical model. Will June see 20% improvement? Will July see a 30 or 40%? And with that, one makes some kind of a calculation as to what kind of a hit one can take. It's probably better to hit hard in the beginning. And when, if situation improves, you can always relax it. It would be more difficult to do it graded later. Uh, where you give more salary this month and next month you say we're going to cut even more. So it's best to do some modeling and do it uh, in the beginning. Uh, we've generally found that employees have been very supportive and they have shown great understanding uh, of the situation, uh, but it's early days. Let's hope the situation improves in the coming months. We would need to see what all other places we can reduce our fixed costs. Say rentals can probably be negotiated. Uh, today, I think all landlords are aware that uh, it will be difficult to find new, new uh, tenants. So if you are in some rented premises, they can be negotiated. Some of the contractual employments can again be negotiated. How can we get some of our pending uh, you know, money that may have got stuck? Fortunately, the government has become very proactive right now. To our surprise, we suddenly find money coming from DBCS, not just in one location, but in uh, multiple locations. We also were able to push and get an income tax refund, which normally remains pending for three years. Uh, we, we got it very easily during this period. So I think the government is very sensitive right now and all these kind of areas where you may have some money stuck, you should push it and try to get them released. 
if you have projects going and the money is already there, I think it's time to re to reach back to the funder and negotiating if that can be repurposed for something that you need right now. It's important, and I think everybody will understand it's very important that these hospitals stay afloat during this crisis. And of course, go back to your donors your, and ask if they can assist during that time. At best, they'll say no, but it's very important that the fundraising activity continues and you ask for support wherever possible. Uh, and you'll be surprised that there are people who will come out and support. Of course, a lot of corporates themselves are facing a crisis and the government is pushing them to give money for Corona. So all these problems are there internationally. Also, this is a problem. But uh, wherever possible, try your best. So it is important to be prepared. Uh, and from that, you can reorganize yourself and learn from it and improve upon what you're doing. And it's, I would say that we need to reconnect. Uh, they will go closer to the patient. I think vision centers, secondary centers are going to recover faster before the large multi uh, speciality hospitals and metros. And that's why it's important to train good comprehensive doctors who are closer to the patient and can deliver even some bit of specialty work over there. So as we move ahead, I think we need to go back and get better comprehensive trained doctors who look beyond cataract. Uh, digital initiators need a big push. Teleophthalmology uh, would be very important uh, for this initiative. Find local employment. Uh, very important to look at financial sustainability through patient accruals and not just grants. And another push that we saw the Prime Minister make is in, for Make in India. And I think that's where we as ophthalmologists also need to play a part. Uh, use more Indian products, position them better, and use them proudly. I think it's important that we do that. Uh, these differentials that we create, uh, maybe that needs to be questioned. There are some good signs uh, in some of the green zones. I think the patient footfalls have increased. Uh, where the lockdown has eased, about 90 to 100 patients we are seeing in our Lakhim Purkiri hospital. Uh, in the last five days, we've done about 30 surgeries. So fortunately, the patient psyche isn't that affected in these places, and they are confidently coming, despite not very stable public transportation. Also important to diversify during the lockdown period as well, uh, other than cataract surgery, some surgeries continue to happen because they need to be done. The injections for retina need to be put regularly. Retinal detachments need to be fixed. So it's important to diversify beyond a single surgery of cataract. And so with that, we see we need to modify the way we work. And eventually, we will come out of this crisis. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, government seems to be putting more focus on healthcare and that should have in the long term a big impact on our work. Uh, we've seen the government being very sensitive right now. The hospital that was taken for quarantine, just with a letter, they vacated it and sanitized it. And the way they worked there was very impressive for the work being done uh, at, by the medical health workers. And uh, I think this, if it continues, will impact on healthcare in general. So stay calm. This time is good. You're staying with your own uh, family. Uh, you're eating right. The air in Delhi and other places has cleaned up. Uh, you're seeing birds and all the different animals on the street sometimes. We had a peacock walking in our OPD the other day. Uh, discover your own talents. And of course, it's important to live within your means. Uh, and I'm sure we will come out of this coronavirus crisis much stronger. Thank you. So, so how do we manage the follow procedures, especially in an emergency eye disorders, you know, given this current COVID outbreak? 
So, uh, follow-up, I, I would imagine the problem is of travel for the patient and uh, how do we continue to remain in touch with the patient. So, I think once you've managed the emergency, whether it's a surgical management or a medical management, uh, if we the patient needs to come, I think today the, the, the lockdown three allows patients to come back to the hospital if you are able to give them a letter that they need a consultation, the police would allow them to travel. Uh, after say the first day follow-up, if you think uh, the patient is uh, okay to be seen by a, an image, maybe we train the patient to take an image and uh, they can send it and you can respond to that. Or they go to a, uh, we connect them to a local practitioner who does the follow-up and with whom you can be in touch. So if somebody is coming from far off from another city, I think it'll be important that we give a contact of a local practitioner there that the patient could follow. Uh, and so there are many, I mean, is there a portable UV sterilization unit that can be used to sterilize some of the items that are, you know, yeah. that are continuously being used? Or is there a better alternate to it? Uh, so what, we have done is we've created one of our exam rooms with a UV light and at the end of the day, all our 90 Ds and 20 Ds, indirects and retinoscopes and things like that, we put in that room with the UV light. Uh, but we have seen smaller contraptions and they can be made in-house as well with the UV light. Say the, there are things that people have created for taking currency notes and putting them in UV light for sterilization. So, uh, but Generally, that wiping with a disinfectant like uh, alcohol swab or hypochlorite is uh, generally waste is sufficient. So depending on what kind of instrument it is, uh, mopping with disinfectant can work. Uh, some of the sensitive instruments like your OCT and uh, instruments like that, you could put a clean film uh, that you use for packing your uh, food uh, on the lens and that could protect and then you can replace it after the patient uh, has been seen. So those are the kind of things that has be, have been done. But uh, you could use any of these sterilizers to help in cleaning the instruments. So is PRP laser therapy possible or not possible? At this time? So there is this thing about... Uh, lasers, both YAG laser and PRP and excimer lasers, that they uh, will disrupt the tear film and cause some uh, aerosol generation. I think putting a shield, having wearing a N95 mask, wearing gloves, uh, having eye protection, uh, with these you are reasonably safe uh, to do those procedures. But if it's something that can be avoided for some time, you could avoid. But if the patient needs an urgent uh, treatment, taking precautions and doing it, I think should be reasonably safe. Now, these are gray zones. I mean, uh, there is no right answer. So uh, we, we don't have enough study to say how much is the risk and how little uh, or what can happen. Uh, but if you take precautions, uh, I think it should be fine to or do the procedure. Uh, why should we avoid AR and, and NCT uh, during this period? Again, the same, uh, they, they release that puff of air disrupts the tear film and it spreads aerosol. So uh, that's why it's avoided. So you, you should avoid an NCT and AR because of the disruption in the tear film that can happen. And since you have alternators available, uh, that can be done and not expensive, uh, like a retinoscopy instead of autorefractometer, it should be fine to avoid it. Um, you know, so interestingly, in India, we have uh, people visiting along with the patients. So we have family members visiting. So is there a, like a systematic change that we can sort of uh, do in the hospital to manage, uh, uh, you know, to let it just the patient is, is allowed inside or, or something? I think one has to have a very, very strict one patient, one attendant policy. I think the only exception would be some 
uh, disabled uh, kind of person who needs to be uh, needs to have an attendant more than one uh, and so at the entrance we've actually created a barrier that allows only one person in uh, so only one at a time and there is somebody watching that nobody more than that enters they also ensure that they have washed their hands before going in and check whether they have a mask and also the declaration that they have to sign so one has to make small changes in the patient flows uh, right at the entrance of the hospital that only one person enters, uh, one attendant comes with the patient. So these changes have to be made. Uh, we've just made, put some chairs under some trees that if there's an extra attendant, they are asked to wait there. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you know, so you, you talked elaborately on, on the outreach model that has obviously changed given the government regulations right now in terms of community outreach. So what can we sort of look at? What kind of model can we look at post this lockdown is over? So uh, I have a feeling the camps may not be, the permissions for camps may not come for a very long time. Uh, because generally one would avoid any collection of people. So I, I would imagine for the next six to 12 months, we are not going to get permissions to do camps. So we will need to modify the way we work. Uh, I think the vision center model is probably going to will need strengthening, where you have a controlled number of patients that come, uh, you can pace them, uh, with that, one can probably go into more intensive door-to-door -door screening instead of collecting people in one place, you go out and uh, screen them. Uh, it may, will be a different game, uh, but I think the camp-based models, at least for some time, may not come unless we all work together and create social distancing norms and create safety during a camp uh, and, and then present it uh, to the authorities. But I think it will, it's, it's going to take some time before that uh, happens. Uh, I think the authorities are not going to be convinced immediately and won't allow camps to happen. So I think we will have to modify the way we do the community work. So you've repeatedly pointed out that vision centers will, will play a very critical role uh, reaching out to the patients as of now. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, like a challenge, a little bit of challenge of space issues there. So how do we yes. like discard the use of used PPEs uh, in such a scenario? Is there a, you know, technique? Yeah, so I, I think we are also in the process of developing a document. We have created the SOP for it. Uh, there would be a problem of space. Vision centers are generally not that large, which can have a lot of chairs for social distancing and things. Uh, we will have to probably there also create some kind of a, uh, an appointment system maybe that you are able to space patients out and have limited number of patients coming at a particular time. Uh, when it comes to PPEs, again, we'll have to, we are looking at, it's a challenge because it it will be very expensive to have everything disposable. Uh, if you have gowns which are reusable and we've been able to get some very nice uh, water resistant gowns, uh, which can be reused, but then uh, they're doffing and then subsequent cleaning in a vision center kind of scenario is not going to be very easy. <clears throat> so these are newer challenges that we will have. Uh, will we be able to bundle them in a, a yellow uh, bag uh, and get them cleaned in a, a sterile, in a, in a safe way? Uh, we are still working on these details, but uh, I think we'll find answers. We'll have to find local answers for these uh, because the staff would need to be protected uh, when they are seeing patients. And we will also need to put good monitoring systems because they are working remotely. We have to 
have good monitoring systems that what whatever systems we put are followed. Uh, so we are finding local places which can safely clean these and how do you do the doffing and then put them in a bag that the gowns can be cleaned safely. So I think these answers can be found, but uh, we'll need to put thermal scanners. Uh, the vision center equipment is going to change uh, because all these norms would have to be put there as well. Uh, so conjunctivitis patients, uh, if, if they're asymptomatic, then how, like, should we do the COVID testing first for them? How do we treat the, such patients? So a conjunctivitis patient, not everyone is going to be COVID positive. So they're not all uh, COVID positives. So if you have a conjunctivitis, I think a torchlight examination outside the waiting area itself should be adequate. Uh, we give them an antibiotic prescription and we ask them for a teleconsultation after five days. If during this period they recover very good, if during this period they develop fever and cough and any symptom, then they are advised to go to a COVID hospital uh, for further testing. If the conjunctivitis uh, is improving, we, they just continue with the antibiotics for some more time. So uh, after five days, we do a teleconsultation with them. Uh, they are given that information, whom to, how to contact, uh, and that seems to be working. We, we basically avoid getting them inside the system. Uh, they've done as a torchlight examination uh, outside the waiting area. Uh, so does the temperature varies with exercise of ambient temperature as long as the homeostasis is maintained by the body. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it does. But these uh, non-contact thermometers are not very accurate. And they malfunction as well. They need to go back for recalibration as well. Uh, so, so that's sometimes a problem. So when you get a positive patient, let's say the temperature is over 100, but the patient feels he doesn't have fever. Uh, and then it's happening again and again, almost every other day. So we've realized that you ask the patient to sit for some time in a shaded area, have some water. After 10 minutes, uh, you check again. And if the temperature comes normal, they're most likely normal. So uh, don't go by just one reading. Uh, the patient may have come uh, in the sun and it's pretty hot outside right now. Uh, also, our guys were checking temperature out in the sun. So we had to modify that, that they have a shade over them and then they check. So small details like that are required uh, to get the accurate temperature. How frequently should we check with the staff for COVID-19 as they are in contact with the patients on a daily basis? No, as of now, the government doesn't encourage you to test uh, asymptomatic people. So if you're staying in an area which is a containment zone and they have a policy for random checking, that's different. As an organization, no, you don't need to. But yes, the thermal scanning and uh, every day when the employees come in, they also have to go through this. Uh, so they also have to go through this. They also have to be asked about any symptoms and only then allowed entry. So, uh, and this was again a process that uh, had to be monitored because uh, just because you're a doctor, they would not check it at the entrance. They would assume you're okay. So I had to put systems that they, and that they have to go through uh, this temperature check. So every employee daily has to uh, walk through the same process as the patients have to. Uh, so that's important to to uh, do. So you have to put those systems in. It's not just for patients, even for staff that uh, the check happens. So for the school eye health programs, uh, of course, schools are shut as of now, but right. when they open up, uh, you know, should we sort of innovate, uh, should we create like innovative models uh, to, 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 to run these school eye health programs or should we move 
around a model with the vision centers uh, to do these programs? No, I think I think we'll have to find. Uh, I think we probably will remain with school health and not the community model and below. Uh, once the schools open, I think we may. Uh, like to find models like would a, something like a photo screener be used by a teacher to pick up uh, suspects and then the secondary screening in a limited number of children can be done uh, with proper social distancing and stuff. Uh, so we'll probably have to innovate and find newer models for school screening. Uh, I think this is a little further away because the schools are shut and I don't see before the summer, uh, now the summer holidays will start. So, so I think we will probably have to work in the next few weeks to see what would be a safe method to do that. So I think there'll be a need for people to put their brains to see what would be a safe method uh, to do that. But I think once Children in general are relatively safe uh, and are not getting the disease as much as the old do. So uh, probably children over a period of time, uh, what will happen is that we have to protect the vulnerable and slowly, slowly, the people who are relatively safe uh, will start going back to their normal process. So uh, I don't know how this, this situation is going to change, but uh, there will be a need to innovate for sure. Uh, the you know, I care ecosystem and the fraternity and hospitals have sort of faced challenge when it comes to government funding for I care uh, in the past. So how do you see, how do we advocate, let's say, given this scenario wherein the government, uh, government's attention has moved again, uh, of course, to the more critical uh, issue of pandemic. But how do you see for government funds in the future, near future for I care? So the limited few weeks have been reasonably encouraging. I think we're not hearing that the government is going to stop Ayushman Bharat. Uh, the government is, for all you know, is only going to strengthen it further. Uh, healthcare is going to get more focus. Uh, I think right now, of course, a lot of attention is going to COVID and rightly so. But I think it's going to leave us with a much stronger uh, system. The data that they have collected right now, they, uh, how many beds in a district, how many uh, ventilators, how many ICU beds, how many ambulances. Uh, I think there's a lot of data that has got collected. Uh, the government and everyone is looking at this whole crisis and hopefully, hopefully, uh, we should come out stronger, not weaker. Also, we are encouraged by the fact that uh, how they are releasing funds like DBCS funds, which used to take you know, months and months of persuasion, uh, that we were surprised to find them coming to us without uh, any, any uh, difficulty. Uh, so the government right now probably understands the situation that hospitals are facing and I don't think that we are going to have any change in the policy. I think that the bigger problem is going to be the delivery since camps and community work is going to uh, be withdrawn for some time. But when it would come to release of funds, hopefully I think it's not going to be affected too much. So I'm reasonably optimistic about it. Sure. Uh, so let me know whenever you know you think. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay, okay. Great, great, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir, in terms of door-to-door -door screenings, um, although again the community outreach has been affected and 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 like there's a limitation when it comes to door-to-door -door screening, but uh, someone has asked, are there specific norms that you would like to suggest for uh, for the door-to-door -door screenings apart from? Social it's still evolving, but we are seeing that the government is using. Asha's and Anganwadi's uh, as the basis for reaching out to villages and at the grassroots level, even during the pandemic, uh, even for managing and awareness building uh, during the coronavirus situation. Uh, so why can't we as eye care professionals also have our foot soldiers uh, 
uh, going out and doing screening instead of collecting people in one place we could also do our bit yes it's not going to be as efficient uh, it would be a little more expensive we, uh, we may not be able to collect that many people together but uh, i think a more intensive program where we we have uh, our vision center and we map out the villages that we want to uh, screen uh, and, and try to make them blindness free or at least have data to do that. And the vision centers could be the nodal point through which we would deliver uh, our care while the screening can happen in a door-to-door -door way. And while these people are doing that door-to-door -door screening, they could also support the system for awareness building of, of how to manage the corona situation, give, give people information about hand hygiene, uh, respiratory hygiene, wearing a mask, but social distancing and all those norms. And if there is a person who has fever, <laughs> knowing where to go. So they could do a dual purpose of supporting the corona problem as well as, uh, as, as the eye care issues. Uh, so next is a million dollar question. <laughs> When can we start routine surgery in larger cities like Delhi or Pune? And, I mean, well, we, st we started our surgeries this week. So we started routine surgeries, uh, elective surgeries. The government has given a notification that elective surgeries are now allowed. Uh, so from Monday, uh, we started our elective surgeries at the hospital. So including cataracts. So of course, the patient numbers are small right now, but uh, I think from the government side, except for containment zone, red zone, orange, green, across, I think the government has given the go ahead that elective surgeries can take place. So, so uh, taking all due precautions, we, we have a 25 minute uh, break between every case, uh, depending on the kind of aerosol generating or not the respective PPEs are worn. Uh, all surgeries are done with double gloves. Uh, we wear N95 masks. We have uh, gowns which are water resistant. Uh, we take all the due precautions, but uh, we have started. We otherwise also autoclave up uh, hand pieces after every case, not just the tips and sleeve. Uh, that's always been our norm. So generally, it's all universal precautions. Uh, the patient also wears a mask during surgery. Uh, we prefer not to give oxygen through a pipe because that's also aerosol generating. And uh, so we prefer not doing that. But uh, it has, uh, we've, we've started in a limited way. Uh, and our secondary center also in central UP has started doing surgery, we, we are doing about five, six surgeries every day over there as well. Uh, sir, is it safe to use a plastic sheet in front of a slit lamp while seeing in OPDs? Uh, or is there a better option? So yeah, any kind of barrier is fine. Uh, initially, because uh, things were not available, we used a transparency kind of sheet, made a hole in the eyepieces, and we uh, created a shield with that. Uh, now we've been able to get make acrylic sheets. So it's a transparent acrylic sheet where we have created this hole through which the eyepieces uh, project uh, out. And that kind of a barrier works quite well, actually. So uh, this, we haven't really, I think there are some commercial available, but uh, actually it can be made very easily in-house. So it basically you need a barrier between the patient and you. Uh, so an acrylic sheet can work quite well. I think there are quite a few WhatsApp messages with pictures and things that are doing the rounds. Uh, we tried using a visor, but uh, I found it difficult to see the slit lamp through it. Uh, but for the rest of the staff, like the assistant in OT, uh, the registration staff, all for them, the barrier with a face shield really works well. 
you know so the outreach has been affected so how do we engage outreach teams uh, when there are no camps of course and should we go only for house to house visit and refer to vision centers or hospitals yeah so i think we'll have to modify the way we work because i think for the next few months the camps uh, i don't foresee getting permissions for them uh, so engaging them in all other kind of activity, even within the hospital, because for this uh, thermal screening, uh, monitoring, uh, patient flows, also because right now we are divided into two or three teams. We don't have enough staff to man each of the uh, stations. So some uh, these outreach team can be utilized for helping within the hospital also right now in the current situation but as the walk-in traffic improves and the situation in the hospital changes and you have staff coming every day then the outreach teams can be used for looking at newer models of outreach whether it's i don't know whether it's practical to do the door-to-door -door for everyone uh, but some kind of local awareness and uh, would help and strengthening a vision center, getting more footfalls into the vision center, opening more vision centers, I think that will be the way to look at community outreach. As it is, the com uh, vision center is a much better model for comprehensive care uh, of a patient. And with teleophthalmology, I think that uh, would be uh, strengthened further. So I think vision centers offer a much better system of uh, community outreach, uh, more scientific way of doing it uh, than the camp-based method. But yes, it's be a change in the model in which we are doing right now. Uh, so can there be any legal issues uh, of any kind for eye doctors or hospitals if they're, if they're providing telemedicine for conjunctivitis or such uh, eye conditions? So, uh, it's very gray right now. It's very gray. We don't have, uh, the government has come out with some telemedicine norms of even taking some kind of a consent uh, that this is a telemedicine consultation and this is not. So I think right now uh, the government would be reasonably, uh, what should I say? It, it, it doesn't have very strong norms for this, uh, I think we should still avoid things like steroids uh, to be prescribed on telemedicine, uh, things like an antibiotic, lubricants, and keeping it that way would be better. And in case you have to prescribe steroids, I think it's better to call the patient into the hospital. So uh, without examining the patient, I think one should not use medication which can potentially have more side effects. Uh, so how can we examine a foreign body lost in the upper phonix? <laughs> well, well, I mean, very specific uh, question. But I think uh, in the clinic, you have to take all precautions. It's like doing a surgery. Uh, you can't be examining a patient the way you used to about three months back. Uh, when we are examining in the clinic, we have to wear uh, protective gear. We need to take all the precautions. Slit lamp after use has to be cleaned again. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, proper hygiene is maintained. And with that, if one needs to examine, you evert the lid and use a sterile needle or whatever uh, you're used to, to remove the foreign body. So uh, it's not like you're not touching the patient. When we are examining the patient, we are having to sometimes touch the patient, uh, retract the lids, uh, but taking all precautions, I think it should be fine. So it's almost uh, when you're uh, doing an outpatient's clinic, you're almost attired like you are in the OR, except the gloves, you may use uh, uh, hand sanitizer over the gloves instead of reusing gloves every time. I think that's the only difference. Otherwise, uh, you're pretty much uh, attired like you are in the OR to do a surgery. 
Uh, so how can we do subjective reflection in OPD for RE and others? Um, Sub subjective refraction must be. Uh, <laughs> so when you're doing a, a refraction, the lenses and the trial frame has to be cleaned after every use. So you clean it with uh, an alcohol swab after use. And, and uh, like you do your normal retinoscopy and subjective refraction, you do it. What we are doing at the end of the day, we leave the trial frame uh, and the retinoscope in the room, which has the UV light. But that really is not going to work the whole day. Between every case, you have to clean and then reuse. So it's it's fine to do a refraction. So I think That's we've, all, we've, we've answered, up, yes, sir. We've also answered almost all the questions. OK. So thank you for giving this opportunity. And I'll be happy to take more questions. If you have more specific needs, uh, my email uh, can be taken through. Uh, and I think, I think Neha would help in giving the email. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions. If you have, uh, you can send it to me by email. And I'll try to answer them. Uh, it has been wonderful interaction and thank you for giving me this opportunity. I know these are questions which are not easy. Uh, can't say anybody is an expert on them. It's very dynamic. The situation keeps changing and uh, you keep evolving and you move from doing too much to too little and then you have to find what's just right. So uh, this is the new normal. But I think it's time we adapted to it. It's not going to change very quickly. Uh, so we have to move on. Uh, and I think the patients, at least in some of the areas we are seeing, uh, are happy to come to a hospital also. So I, I'm not sure of the metro cities, but uh, outside they are. So let's hope for the best and take all precautions and do things safely. So thank you so much for uh, listening in and uh, I hope it was useful.